Hello everyone, uh, welcome back for some more video lectures. This is uh, um, going to be the start of a few, a series of video lectures uh, to cover the um, language of arguments module, the second module that we've got in the class. Um, and we've got a lot of stuff to talk about and I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible, but there's a lot of things to mention. Um, I'm heading out in the nursery today, baby's over there, so everything's going good. I haven't heard from anyone yet about baby being a distraction. Let me know if that is the case. I won't do it again. Um, I feel like that might have to happen sometime later in the quarter, but still working things out. Everything's good. Eh, things are pretty good right now. Um, <clears throat> but that's not what you're here to hear about. You're here to hear about language of arguments. So um, I've got the lecture notes here that we're going to follow along with. And I've got uh, my little makeshift uh, whiteboard, which is Microsoft Paint, so that'll help guide us. This, um, you can see a little diagram here. These are different levels of linguistic analysis. Language of, is a very complicated object. Re really, when I um, when I like to start uh, this lecture, I like to mention how when we're trying to figure out what people mean, we have this intuitive voice in our head that uh, tells us, oh, the person meant that. But um, that little, that meaning that your intuition, that little voice in your head tells you is what people mean by what they're saying is something that is integrating quite a lot of different information and information that and meanings that are coming from a variety of sources. And in particular, there are these three kind of levels of sources of meaning that um, want to talk about but the the image you can have in your head this is kind of a nasty image but um, I, I don't know I've got to come up with a better one than this but that little intuitive voice that's in your head that's telling you what people mean is kind of like barfing out this meaning and it's like a big mass of all sorts of things kind of like a casserole or something and what we're gonna do in this module we're gonna learn this skill about how to um, pull apart those different contributions to the overall meaning. And I like to, to, to start off by talking about this because uh, it's a good metaphor for a lot, or it's a good ex case example of a, what a lot of stuff in this class is going to be like. I mentioned before that in a previous lecture that we have a tendency to think of ourselves as better critical reasoners than we actually are. We have a very bad tendency to do that. Um, and a lot of us uh, rely on our intuition to make judgment calls uh, when it comes to critical reasoning. And I, this isn't to say this isn't all leading in the direction of saying intuition is bad. You got to watch out for it. But the it, your your intuitions are actually incredibly smart. They're integrating a lot of information and doing so in a way that is generally extremely competent. I I don't tell my students that they need to take critical reasoning to gain a skill that they lack. You already are a critical reasoner. Despite the fact that I think we think we're better critical reasoners than we in fact are, you are a good critical reasoner. You do not need this class in order to uh, think critically. You're already doing it and your intuition is pretty good at that. But a lot of this class is about making the implicit and the intuitive explicit and you might say analytic um, with rational concepts and principles. We're taking something that we do um, intuitively and put it under the microscope and see what's actually going on here. How is my intuition functioning? What is it sensitive to? What are the actual mechanics of this? And there are two major reasons for this, uh, for, the, for why you might want to take a class like this and to engage with your intuitions in this way and really break them down and deconstruct them. One is that we will be able to uh, perform those skills more effectively and more competently. So intuition is competent but uh, in many cases, but there are cases where it breaks down and sometimes truth is stranger than fr fiction and, and sometimes the intuitions are misfiring. So we would want to be able to detect when that's happening and be able to correct that. And looking at how the intuitions function and kind of spelling them out with more explicitness can help us kind of double check and, and see how we're doing and to increase that competency. So there is there is a benefit on the level of competency to studying critical reasoning explicitly. But I, I think one of the cooler benefits here, or I don't know which one's more important, but I think this one's all, this one might fly under the radar. Um, everyone knows that take a class and get better at a skill. Okay, duh, not, not a big surprise there. But this one might be a little, you might not think about this one quite so readily. Um, the other reason why we might want to make the implicit explicit is so that we can articulate it. 
so that we can communicate with other people and share our thinking. Where otherwise, um, if we're just using a lot of intuitional reasoning as the way we engage with the world, then if we meet those lucky people that uh, that uh, share our intuitions, then we'll get each other. You know, you'll understand. You won't even have to say anything. You'll just kind of you're like we're on the same wavelength. You know, we use that phrase. Um, but what if we're not on the same wavelength? What if we're not so lucky? Um, being able to take something that you know how to do intuitively and understand it explicitly will empower you with a vocabulary and a language that allow you to articulate what you're doing so that someone who doesn't share your intuitions can follow and understand. And especially when on our first subject of conversation here, just linguistic meaning itself, communication, um, that's a really valuable skill. If you're able to know, you're able to show someone else how you arrived at the conclusions that you did arrive at or why you're in, what are your intuitions sensitive to and how are they working, um, then that I think really helps with our ability to work collaboratively together with truth seeking like we were talking about with the Code of Intellectual Conduct. So a lot of the class is uh, taking the implicit, making it explicit so that we can get better at it and to be able to communicate about our reasoning with other people to collaborate with them. So um, that's kind of my little bit of introduction. Applied to language, we intuitively make judgments about what we think people mean, but we're going to break this down really explicitly to see how it actually works um, and, and pull those threads apart. So another um, reason why I wanted to talk about this is to give you a warning. Don't just rely on your intuition in giving answers on the homework problems or in picking up the the kinds of concepts and principles and techniques that we're we're learning here you won't just be able to rely on your intuition to make the correct judgment um, and the very least you want to be able to explain uh, why you I mean, intuitions are going to come in here but we want to be intentional about it uh, about how we're using them and self aware about how we're using them as well okay so let's get started here on my lecture on my lecture notes if you see here there's there's some real basic stuff, uh, some basic building blocks for critical reasoning and argumentation that we should talk about, and we'll get into language here really quickly. I think I'm going to try to skim over this um, uh, just a little bit, um, but there are some cool things to, to talk about here. First, let's just really make sure we're, we're all starting from uh, square one here. What are arguments? Arguments are not disagreements. Um, arguments are not having strong opinions. Um, arguments, we, we're going to use this word in a very technical sense in this class, uh, even though this is the most technical definition you've probably ever seen. But to say that an argument is just a claim supported by other claims, meaning at least one other claim, but you could have more than one other claim, um, that is, there is some, there's some technicality to that definition here that we want to stay true to. So if you just have um, a position, and or maybe a position that has like a whole host of claims like you might write a manifesto or something like maybe you write an artistic or political manifesto something like that manifesto is just kind of like a list of everything a person believes it may not have any arguments in it even if there's a kind of cohesive paradigm here with a bunch of claims that are compatible with each other um, you don't have an argument until someone is intentionally advancing a claim on the grounds of some other claim. There's some other claim that gives it support or rational justification. That's what we're talking about here. I'm going to talk a lot in this class about um, the support relation in arguments because I could actually sum up this entire class in just a couple sentences here in terms of how, how do you tell whether an argument is a good one or a bad one. There's really only two standards we care about for arguments. One, um, it's got to have true premises. So uh, let me get those terminology out here too. We're going to talk arguments are composed of a conclusion supported by premises. So the claim that's getting support, that is the conclusion, and the claims that give support are the premises. So um, there's a support relation between these claims. Some of the claims are giving the support, some of them are receiving it. And I'm going to talk a lot about the support relation. Okay, so, um, but the two standards for what makes for a good argument is one, the premises are all true. If you're building uh, a house on shifting sand, it's going to fall down. If you got a bad foundation, whatever you put on top of that foundation will also fall down. Um, if we're advancing the conclusion on the basis of the premises, but the premises are false, terrible argument. That doesn't give you a good reason to believe anything. Uh, it's like um, 
a scientist who publishes a conclusion and supports it with fabricated data. You know, that's not going to be a good argument. If the, or the, if the evidence is just erroneous, it's not going to prove anything. So having true premises is important, and I think we all kind of intuitively recognize that. When we hear arguments given to us from other people, you know, one thing I think we're generally thinking about is how, you know, you could take issue with the claims that the person is using to justify or defend their position. Like, maybe those claims are false. Okay, so that's one. The second one, though, is about having a good support relation that the way like you could have claims that are true but they don't do a good job justifying the conclusion let me give you a really goofy silly example um, <laughs> I could say if I'm like the playground bully or something and I take in a little bit of logic or something I might say um, you should give me five dollars and if when you say why I'll say um, because it's Friday it's Friday so you should give me five dollars. It isn't actually Friday. Actually, I'm recording this lecture on Thursday. So it runs afoul of the first standard of a good argument. <laughs> but it, even if it, if I said, okay, it's Thursday, so you should give me five dollars. I'm recording this on Thursday. Um, there's no link between the truth of the premise and the truth of the conclusion. So it's a bad argument, even if the premises are true. And I think this is a standard that um, maybe flies a little more under the radar in terms of our bullshit detectors, our intuitive bullshit detectors when we're evaluating arguments. Just because someone's got, say, true facts at their disposal to back up their position doesn't mean that they've given a good argument if those facts are not the right kinds of claims, uh, the, the right kind of truth to back up the truth of the conclusion that is being um, pushed forward. So. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about the support relation and how to tell whether you have a good one or a bad one. That's what the entire second chunk of our quarter is devoted to, is just how to understand whether an argument has a good support relation or not. Um, but I use this, I talked about it as a playground bully. You might be like, that's a really weird bully because there's no threat going on. But um, So take that case, if I said, you should give me $5 because it's Thursday, okay, that's a bad argument because the support relation is too weak. Even if the premise is true, the truth of the premise doesn't give me any good reason to think the conclusion is true. But what if I uh, if I did as like a bully? You know, sometimes we're like, oh, bully gives me a good reason. In fact, there's a famous uh, Peanuts cartoon. I don't know if anyone ever reads Peanuts anymore, but uh, Charles Schultz's um, um, comic book strip. Um, but one of the, there's a famous line from one of them where um, Lucy is asking Charlie Brown for money or something like that, or wants wants him to do something for her. Um, and Charlie Brown is why, and she says, "I'll give you one, two. I'll give you five reasons." Here, you actually probably need to see me for this joke. Um, she's like, "I'll give you five reasons. One, or how she does it like this: one, two, three, four, five. And it's a fist. So <laughs> um, that actually, like a threat or bullying or something like that, is actually in the same category as the previous kind of argument that um, we provided. If if the person is saying you should believe this conclusion or you should do this action you should think this action is the right thing to do it's the justified action to do because of something like coercive use of force or threat um, that's not a good argument either it actually doesn't provide a reason for the conclusion and our English language is fuzzy on some of this stuff but as you can see in my lecture notes I say in critical reasoning we're not concerned with just any type of justification or reason to believe a conclusion, but we're interested in rational justification aimed at truth. That's the most classical definition of, of argumentative justification. This kind of bullying thing is kind of like the pragmatic situation. That you, The bully could maybe convince you to treat a belief as if it was true, but they can't give you a reason to treat the belief as true. Um, here, here's another um, example from history that I like to use. Um, and this is not to like you know, just rag on religion or something. I think I've told you all I'm I'm religious myself, so I'm not trying to do any religion bashing here. But there have been some not fun periods in the history of pretty much every major religion on the planet, pretty much every culture on the planet, and pretty much every ideology that anyone has ever thought is a good idea. But here's, here's a particular historical case example. Dark Ages in France. Civilization's basically been wiped out. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of Mad Max-ish with the... Um, the vacuum of power that's going on. I mean, civilization is just in tatters. Infrastructure is ruined after the fall of Rome. And um, there's no centralized power. There's warlords going around everywhere. 
uh, trying to fill in that power vacuum, and the church is still around, um, and the church is kind of in the the Christian church in France is at, for that region almost like um like the last uh, repository of human civilization. Like books are getting destroyed everywhere. Church is trying to like get books. All this philosophy was preserved because the church hung on to it through the dark ages. Um, they're trying they're they're kind of holding trying to hold things together a little bit. And one way that they're trying to create some political stability is that they started siding with some of these warlords. They're like, you're our horse. And so they kind of uh, gave the warlord permission to use the legitimacy of the church to kind of advance their own political interests. And guess what the warlords are doing? Um, they're like, cool, this sounds great. So they start going around to villages and stuff. And you know, imagine this situation like big axe over your head and someone's like, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Under threat, like, we're going to kill you if you don't. Like, are you going to side with us or not? Um, if you don't side with us, we'll kill you. And that situation, might you might, if you're a rational person who's a victim of this situation, you might be like, do I have a good reason to say yes? Maybe. You know, maybe there are some, like, prudential reasons here for me to say, yes, I do accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That axe, the presence of the axe, maybe gives me that re the reality of that threat gives me some reason to do that. But think, let's be careful about the situation. Would we really say that the presence of the axe, the threat of death, on its own is evidence that Jesus Christ really is your Lord and Savior? No, it doesn't. All it can do is coerce a type of behavior that would be consistent with having that belief sincerely, but isn't the same as actually feeling like that belief is actually justified. That's what I have in mind here with this distinction. Here, let me pull it up again. This distinction between um, treating a belief as if it was true, but not a reason that the belief is true. And I do say here, there's some little notes here. I say riff on this of interest. It's a class discussion going. If you want to ask me about this, like maybe tonight at the study session or something, that's be great. Uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe you won't get this video in time. Um, but you could ask me about this if you're curious at, at, at some point during the quarter. But there is... Um, I gave you this classical definition of rational justification, um, but there is philosophical debate and controversy around how to think about reason, how to think about truth, and this distinction between treating belief as if it was true pragmatically versus that the belief is in fact robustly true, that has been attacked by some philosophers. So there's some there's some hay that's made around that. That's why I say this isn't an absolute rule. Um, but <clears throat> and this is getting into deeper levels that maybe you'd want to ask me about, but. Even if, uh, like, pragmatism, here's, here's the thesis of philosophical pragmatism. Philosophical pragmatism is saying, um, who cares whether claims are true or false? It doesn't matter. What matters is whether operating with certain beliefs allows us to fulfill the goals that we have. And that's why it's called pragmatism. It, it's a matter of believing what works, you might say. It's like a slogan. But we've got to be really careful about this because... The projects that most philosophical pragmatists have in mind, the things we're trying to achieve, are not just things like putting food on the table or building good bridges or being able to build smartphones or something like that. It's not just like technology and basic needs of life. The, most of the time, pragmatists are really thinking about things like theoretical projects. Like we want explanations for our experience. Who cares whether the theory that we posit about how the world actually is matches up with how the world actually is? something that the pragmatist doesn't think we have contact with. Um, they're just like, it doesn't matter if it fulfills the things that we're looking for, like an explanation that's better than any other explanation that we have, um, or something that's consistent with our experience and is not confounded by our experience. If it's a belief that doesn't get us into trouble or fail or something like that, then, um, then that's great. That's the most that we could hope for anyway with rational justification. To start talking about truth and holding ar arguments accountable to truth, well, that's just uh, that's chasing a dragon that you'll never be able to catch. So pragmatism gives up on that. That's that's in that's a really quick and dirty um, definite uh, picture of pragmatism. It's a lot more complex than that. And actually, pragmatism has been a little interest of mine. I've spent some time studying it, so I could talk about that more if you're curious. But um, even that kind of um, pretty extreme criticism of this sort of classical way of thinking about rational justification. Even pragmatism would create some kind of distinction that's similar to this distinction between treating a belief as if true versus 
a reason that the belief actually is true. They would want to say, they, the pragmatist will not say that that axe that's hanging over your head is evidence for believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That's not a sincere, that's not sincere rational justification. How they would defend that or why that would be something that pragmatism requires, um, I'm not going to go deeper down the rabbit hole of that tangent right now. But like I said, if you're curious about it, feel free to ask me. Um, but I wanted to mention that just because I like to, I like to, um, um, in the material that I'm teaching, I always like to acknowledge how, where controversies actually are and to not just um, present things as being more straightforward or uncontroversial than they actually are just for the sake of like um, educational expediency because it's simpler to talk that way about it. So I like to at least give you some little like flags for where, where there is some real debate about stuff. So again, I got, I'm going to try to be good about all the tangents I like to go on, but that one might be worth it. So I, I did it. All right. Um, the, the obstacles I'm referring to here in my lecture notes, that's from, um, here I can actually pull it up. That's from that um, bit of intro lecture that I uh, provided from my friend James that you would have seen in that other video lecture that I did, this stuff right here. James has the, my friend James, made a list of these things, these obstacles to critical reasoning, relativism, subjectivism, egocentrism, intimidation by authority, conformism, ethnocentrism, and being overly unreflective. Um, a lot of those kinds of concerns or those things that distract us away from critical reasoning are really um, making this kind of confusion between something that motivates me to an accept a belief and something that actually contributes to a proof of that claim. Um, so I, I will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna move on from there. Okay. So um, now let's talk. Let's transition um, a little more explicitly into language. So the reason why I wanted to start the actual substance of this class talking about some linguistic theory um, and some philosophy of language is primarily because. All language happens in the context, or all sorry, all arguments happen in the context of language. So um, if we're going to be engaging in debate, if we're going to provide arguments or evidence to justify our claims, we're always using language to do that. And it's useful to try to separate out um, if we're if we're going to start evaluating arguments to recognize what's happening from the language side of things and what's happening from the actual like content of the claims, the rational content of the claims. That language is just the vehicle for expressing. So I want to pull apart like what if we're trying to diagnose a disagreement, is it coming from language or is it coming from a rational controversy? That's a, that's one of the big things we're worried about. And that's one of the first things I talk about here in um, in in my lecture here, that it is possible for our arguments to just devolve into semantic disputes. Some um, I see that kind of response all the time in public discussions around a debate that's taking place or, or an argumentative disagreement. Oftentimes, someone might even try to come in as the peacemaker and say, "Look, I think I think you two people are just talking past each other. You're using words in different ways, and that's why you think you disagree. And maybe in reality, you don't actually disagree. It's just that you talk about things in different ways. Sometimes that happens. That is a real thing." Um, but as I say here, sometimes uh, that isn't all there is to it. Sometimes, and I would actually argue that um, in most cases where people are talking past each other because they're using different language, it's likely that there is some kind of ideological or rational disagreement taking place between them because um, different perspectives, um, different theories, different worldviews, um, different paradigms are um, drawn toward developing a different type of language that fits with that perspective. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is the field of psychology. There's all these different schools of thought in psychology and they all have their own idiosyncratic names for phenomenon that are similar. Um, you, and you might be like, if I'm a psychoanalyst trying to touch, talk to an attachment theorist and I'm like, what's, when you use that word, do you mean what we mean by this? Or what, you know, what's going on for whatever side you're on? Um, you have to kind of maybe do some translation between them. And it might be that both of them are talking about the same phenomenon. But they develop different labels for those things or different language to express or articulate those thoughts or to capture those phenomenon because that that way of speaking aligns a little more clearly with how that 
school of thought in psychology uh, wants to interpret that phenomenon or attach significance to it or make other claims about what's going on with that. So um, I always say be on the lookout. If you, if you want to increase um, some of your um, dialectical or debate competency instantly, watch for language. Watch to and some and sometimes ask people to clarify their terms. Like we talked about the principle of clarity on the code of intellectual conduct. Um, sometimes, if you're sensing that something goofy is going on, ask people just define what they mean by words. That's why we do that, not to just be um, OCD or something. It's like it's trying to make sure that we're on the same page with how we're communicating. Um, but then also, when you see people using language in different ways, don't just chalk the disagreement up to that. Um, go looking. Go trying to find like where where is there a disagreement? I think I may have mentioned in a previous lecture how philosophers are like looking for trouble. They're trying to find where where controversies are so that we can get some productive work done on them, rather than just kind of rehashing the things we already know or or what, that we already agree on. Let's find the stuff that we disagree on. So that's what I'm saying down here at the maximum of the day. Don't be afraid of disagreements. Identifying them is a first and necessary step to real reconciliation and agreement, if that's the goal. Um, even if we're talking about rational agreement, like on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, if we can agree for mutually understandable reasons what is the most defensible position on an issue, that's what we're going for. In a more relational setting, it might be a matter of reconciliation. I, I kind of like to... Um, um, use like friendships and and family relationships here as as a kind of little example or demonstration that if something's going on um, that's a real disagreement then <clears throat> you kind of need to address it it's, it doesn't work um, in a very long-term effective or maybe ideal way to let a disagreement just just kind of like avoid it we all do it in our relationships sometimes for a very very long time where there's you know you just know hey me and this person we got this problem and we just avoid getting into that problem because of the conflict that it creates but if there's going to be some reconciliation then that that conflict or that breach or that distance needs to at least be addressed before um, some kind of deeper reconciliation could happen too. Same thing with uh, truth seeking. I don't. I don't think they're really all that different. Uh, maybe you disagree with me about that. And we could. We could argue about it. But that. That's how. That's. So that's like um, when I've been like, this is just Tim Lineman, a person who thinks about stuff. That's just that. I'm not speaking with any kind of authority as your instructor on that. That last little claim about relating rational disagreement and dialogue to relationships, but. Um, that is definitely how I think about it. Um, I think I skipped something here. Um, oh, yeah, okay, so when I was talking about why we want to study language, it's kind of like how a artist wants to understand their medium um, that they're expressing themselves in. They want to know how it works. I think I talked about Bob Ross in a previous lecture about this, but the, um, or maybe I didn't. Maybe that was in the lecture that got deleted. Uh... Uh, maybe I did. Okay, just to be safe, I might be repeating myself, but it's worth it. I've been I've been watching some Joy of Painting this summer while we were waiting for the baby to come, because uh, Netflix uh, put it on there. Bob Ross, I don't know if you know the guy with the afro from the '70s, hippie paints paintings amazingly in like 30 minutes. He just like whips out a painting. You're like, what? It's like all happening before my eyes. It's very entertaining. I I recommend it. Joy of Painting. Um, happy little trees. And one of his favorite things to say is. There's no mistakes, just happy accidents. He's a total hippie. But anyway, Bob Ross makes this amazing thing happen where he just creates landscapes out of marks with the painting that just looks like garbage to begin with, and then it sort of transforms before your eyes into like a really amazingly amazing looking painting, very realistic. Um, and how how is he able to do that? Well, it's because he understands how his paints work. He understands how the brushes, the canvas, the the little plate things, or what do you call them, the uh, paint knives, uh, how they work, and what kind of pressure to apply. Because he understands the mechanics of his medium, he can express himself in a certain way and make, make a sort of vision come alive. And that's the same thing with arguments. Um, maybe you've had this experience where like, ar arguing can be tough. It's a challenging activity. And one of the hardest parts is not just coming up with the reasons but being able to just articulate your ideas, like just figuring out how to show another person what's the what's the logic that's taking place in your head. You're like, 
I, I know what I mean, and it makes sense to me. The other person might be like, I don't see how that makes sense. Help me out. And you're like, oh, but I tried, blah, 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 and it, it's not really working. Um, it doesn't really click for them. Um, that studying language will help with that. So um, that's why we're, uh, that's another reason we're doing it. And um, I really want to talk about this idea before we leave this behind. The other reason why it um, is valuable to start this class with language is that before we can criticize something, we have to understand it. Our criticism is worthless if we haven't understood the thing that we're criticizing first. Um, or if it's at all helpful, it's just because we got lucky and took a shot in the dark. Um, so if we develop our listening better, if we listen first for understanding and then um, speak to be understood, speak critically to, to test and evaluate things, then, then that's the right way to proceed. For this reason, this whole first third of the quarter, I'm not going to be asking you to evaluate arguments. I'm not, not, not in the kind of sense of like, do you think this argument makes sense or doesn't make sense? Or is it open to objection or is it airtight? We're not going to do that at all. We're going to be doing a lot of evaluating or an analyzing of arguments to track them and see what's happening with them, see what movements are taking place and what techniques and strategies there are in, in argumentative debate. But we're not going to be figuring out whether they're bullshit or not just yet. So hang on to your horses with that. We will be getting to that eventually. But first, we're going to work on listening. Okay, so with all that introductory material out of the way, um, let's get to the real meat of the week um, of this module. So every every module in the class um, has some like concepts and, and big ideas that are present with it, but also... Um, there are going to be some very specific techniques that we're trying to learn that are kind of the application of those concepts and principles. Um, and this this one's not going to be any different um, than all the rest of them. Let's go back to my little whiteboard here. So the ultimate goal, um, and it, this might be for, for those of you who are like, is it on the test? What's on the test? Well, the, the big thing that's going to um, show up on the first exam that's coming from this module is this um, linguistic analysis activity. And like with the metaphor I was using at the start of this lecture, it's like pulling apart um, the different sources that contribute to the overall linguistic meaning of an, ex an expression, an utterance, an inscription, when, whenever we're using language to communicate with each other. Um, and there, on the exam, I'll give you a little snippet of dialogue, um, some kind of interaction between two people. I'll underline a section that I want you to do this analysis on. So I give you some context, maybe a little bit of a conversation, and then there's one utterance that I'll I'll have you analyze, and I'll ask you five questions about it. I'm going to ask what's I'll tell you right now, and then as this lecture goes on, we'll be cashing out what what I'm really asking when I'm asking these questions and how to go about answering them. But I'll just give you the questions right now so that you you're familiar with them and and I can bring them up again as we're going through the the, the, de the nitty-gritty details here. So the five questions will be this. I'll ask you to tell me what's the literal meaning of the utterance, and then I'll ask you to tell me what's the implied meaning of that, ex of that utterance. And then I'll ask you what's the speech act, and then I'll ask you what's the conversational act, and then the final, and those will all be kind of like simple uh, maybe a couple words or one line kinds of answers. The, the, it won't get much more complicated than that. But the last question is going to be the more complicated one. The, the fifth question is, how is explain to me how the implication is generated. What creates that implied meaning? Um, and that you'll have to kind of walk me through. So you'll have to tell a little story about that. And I, I've got a lot of tips and tricks and and, and hints here for how and, and advice about how to go about doing that analysis and how I'll be grading it and what I'm looking for with that. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing. I, those first four questions are trying to pull out different contributions to the overall meaning. And then the last one is asking you to kind of explain in a little more detail how that meaning got created. So check out this little chart I've got. We've got um, three different levels. This, this is coming from um, a few philosophers of language from the 20th century, um, most notably J.L. Austin and a, a, a more contemporary um, philosopher named Paul Grice. Paul Grice is the one who's really going to add the part about how implication works. Um, 
And and honestly, uh, man, the first time, I, I think I might have mentioned this in a previous lecture, but I was floored the first time I encountered Paul Grice's theory because I thought no one could make a universal theory for how conversational implication works, how subtext works. I thought it was just all completely, um, you know, depends on context kind of a thing and people just guessing with their imaginations and there's not really any pattern or logic of a more robust sense. But I, I'm, Paul Grice, there's some people that, this is an ongoing conversation, different linguists and different philosophers of language. You know, some people are bigger fans of Paul Grice than others. Personally, I, I'm pretty swayed. I think he's on to something. If he doesn't have the whole story, he I, at least I think has a big part of the story. Um, but uh, I think it, it'll be very, it's, it's also very practically useful. So this is just kind of another tool in the toolkit. Um, so we'll be running with it for this class, but there's some more controversy around that too. Paul Grice is widely uh, accepted and acknowledged, but not everyone, as with most things in philosophy. Uh, there's always someone who disagrees with everything. Um, okay, but let's let's go back to the, the model here. So these, coming from Austin and from Grice, they're telling us that language has these kind of three levels of meaning to it. Ling the meaning that happens on this linguistic act level, the speech act level, and this conversational act level. And on my chart, um, I'm going to be doing a couple different things. So uh, here, where's my um, tools? I'm going to get a little drawing thing out here. So up here on this level up here, I will be uh, on this chart. This will be this chart is available in the um, module as a, another like study aid here to help you remember all this stuff. But I'm going to build it out as we talk about it. I thought that would be kind of like a nice demonstration. So um, that what will happen here in the top up here is um, the meaning that we get at this level of analyzing language. What I'm going to put down here in this box down here is what is responsible for constructing the meaning that we get up here. So there's what is the contribution that this level of meaning provides to the overall meaning. Remember what that little intuitive voice in your head is like putting all the pieces together. Um, and the bottom is determining uh, how or is setting how that content gets created. How does that meaning, uh, where does that meaning come from? So that's what we're going to be doing, and we're going to. This actually does build um, in a um, in a linear fashion. So the meaning that we get at the linguistic act level is necessary before we can start thinking at what meaning we get at the speech act level, and both of those are required before we're ever able to think about meaning at the conversational act level. Um, another thing I want to note here before we dive into the details. Implication is showing up here and not over here in linguistic acts or speech acts. It's only in implication. In fact, I can, I'm going to um, make this a double bar to emphasize just how much of a divide there is. Um, if you, so when you're listening to what someone is saying, if you are interpreting what they're saying in some, if you think you're being at all clever and trying to work out what they really mean, you're thinking about the meaning on, at this conversational act level where there is implication. Um, the linguistic act and speech act levels of meaning, what they contribute to overall linguistic meaning is always um, public and explicit and there's nothing sneaky about it. I always have some students who are trying to be really clever with their linguistic analysis and keep an eye on it because um, there's no sneaky, there's not supposed to be any sneakiness happening at these first two levels here. Okay, but what's going on with them? Let's let's start talking about them. And if you're following along in the lecture notes, that's this is where we're at here. There are these three levels of analysis. Uh, J.L. Austin talks about these as locutionary, illocutionary, and perlocutionary acts. Those are really obnoxious labels because they all sound similar and they're easy to be confused with each other. So we're just going to talk about linguistic acts, speech acts, and conversational acts. And in my lecture notes, there's like little definitions here, um, some discussion about what's going on with that meaning, um, sometimes some examples. But these are going to get progressively more complicated, and the real main game, like I say here, the main course is the conversational acts and conversational implication. That's where things are going to get hairy. So 
um, you know, don't make things more complicated than they are. I, I'm, um, I have a, a friend who is a math teacher, and we we were comparing some teaching notes one day, and and um, we were like, oh, we both say this thing, and she was like, I always say that like mathematicians are lazy; they don't want to do more work than they have to do, and that to like motivate her students to. Um, to not try to do things in a more complicated fashion than is really required. Don't you don't need to get fancy. There's no style points in math. Well, okay, maybe I, that's not elegance in logic and math definitely counts for something. But I'm I say the same thing about critical reasoners and logicians. We're lazy. We don't want to make things more complicated just for the sake of be, things being more complicated. We want to make things more complicated only when there's some actual payoff. If it actually matters, if it's worth it. Um, so. So don't you know? Don't try to try to get fancy uh, here. Really do the minimum work that's needed. Um, maybe I should be a little careful about saying that, but um, the minimal work that is needed—that's the key part here. Okay, so knowing what is needed is is part of it. Um, I do. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll 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 talk, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Tangents. Mm. Okay. So we're at this linguistic act level. What do we get here? So in an informal sort of way, I like to say that linguistic acts tell us, the linguistic act level of meaning tell us what is literally said, or the literal meaning. And another phrase I like to use for this is that um, linguistic, the linguistic act level of meaning uh, gives us a picture um, that is painted by the words. Okay, and um, this content comes from the semantic and syntactic conventions of the language. My typing is so slow because I'm holding this microphone. Sorry. Okay, the semantic and syntactic conventions of the language. So, um, you know, Austin call and and Grice too. They call this a linguistic act. So let's let's talk about the action part of it. Um, the 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 purpose of this is to distinguish actions that involve expressing yourself in a language versus actions that don't do that. And one of my favorite examples for this is baseball. Baseball involves uh, baseball is a linguistic activity um, because uh, in baseball people are expressing themselves with language all the time. You got the catcher who's like doing the signals, you know. You got the uh, the um, base running coach that's like doing that, all that signal. That's happening. Um, the one of the examples from the textbook is an umpire calling a batter out. They say you're out. You know that's expressing yourself in a language. There's Pointing, gesturing, that's expressing yourself in a language. There's lots of activities that do this. Um, I say in the lecture notes, like, don't limit it to just natural languages like English, or Spanish, Japanese, German, whatever. Um, dancing, singing, singing nonsense things could, like music itself has a language. Um, of course, signing, um, sign language, drawing. Drawing certainly is a linguistic activity. Um, I'll, you'll see me draw some terrible pictures on the board at some point, I think, here. Um, and that has semantic content to it. It's representing something. It's, it's a sign that signifies some sort of meaning. Um, even uh, things like um, body language and tone of voice and things like that count as linguistic activities because they're expressing a meaning in a language. And what's a language? Well, a language is a set of conventions that associates um, a symbol with what it stands for, with what it represents. That's actually a little controversial. Um, there's a philosopher in the 20th century named Ludwig Wittgenstein that thought that this model for understanding linguistic meaning was way, way too narrow. And that language and where meaning comes from is actually more about what people are doing. It's interesting um, for me to bring this up because um, Wittgenstein actually is, um, this is in the background, 
of the concern with speech, the speech act level of meaning, which tells you, as I like to say informally, what is literally done. But we'll talk. We'll talk about that. And I'm I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, Austin and Grice use. Um, they incorporate some Wittgensteinian ideas, but they don't go whole hog on Wittgenstein's condemnation of this very traditional way of thinking about linguistic meaning, which is probably the one that you intuitively use. You're like, you see a stop sign, or uh, I say you're at a stoplight and the light goes green. Green means something. It's a symbol, and there's a meaning that's connected with it. It's okay to go. It's safe to go. It's your turn. Something, maybe something of that kind of. Um, on that kind of level in that ballpark is what the green is supposed to symbolize in that context. So anytime you've got representational meaning, you've got a language. But all languages require some set of conventions for how to connect those things together. So um, that's what we mean by syntactic and semantic uh, conventions. Or I, I guess what I was just talking about, this representational aspect, that's the semantic part. That's about what does the thing stand for. Syntax is a matter of, like, say, grammar. Um, so the things, um, again, in a, in a little more informal way, I like to just say that if you're thinking about what determines the linguistic act level of meaning, you can think about what you would get from a dictionary with a grammar text. Syntax is about how you put linguistic objects together to create meaningful thoughts. So, like, grammar is a good example of this, that um, in all the natural languages, there's an order that words come in. Um, in English, you got subject, verb, object. That's the order um, that these words come in. And because we are aware of that order, we don't confuse subjects and objects, even though they're both nouns. So if I say, Tim... Um, Tim likes the Cubs, then the Cubs is not the subject of that sentence. It's Tim, and Cubs is the object. And we know that because of the grammar rules. If we weren't all operating with the same grammar rules, we wouldn't be able to communicate um, at, at, at all. We wouldn't even get off the ground. And linguistic act meaning is where things get off the ground. I'm talking about, uh, I, I like to give students this uh, informal way of speaking about it by saying it's what's literally said. Um, mostly because, uh, uh, okay, sorry, let me start over here. <laughs> um, there's some danger about this word literally. I like giving informal ways of thinking about things rather than just always using te technical jargon constantly. But literally, we got to be careful about. Literally can easily just stand for that little, what that little voice in your head is telling you, what intuition is telling you they meant. Because most of the time, our our linguistic reflections don't go very far past linguistic acts in terms of how we're explicitly thinking about it. Our intuition is actually jumping all the way to the end, but um, in terms of what we reflect and recognize that we're doing, we don't usually get very far past the linguistic act level of understanding unless we study language or, or think about these things a, a little more deeply. So um, got to be careful about that. And one way to describe a lot of what we're doing here at this linguistic analysis breakdown is actually trying to take that natural intuitive competency and slow it way the hell down so that we can see all the little moves that are actually being made, how we're getting from point A to point B, how we are interpreting this as having this meaning. So we need to, we need to slow it down. And only in slow motion would we be able to see all the steps that take place. Uh, you're in, that's why I was saying, like, you're so smart intuitively. You get, you understand so much without having to have any recognition of what you're doing or how you're able to do it. Um, I always like using this analogy. Um, another tangent here. Get ready for more. Um, I always like to bring up the example of learning a second language. So um, someone who learns a language as a second language versus, versus um, someone who, that's their natural language, um, they have to, you have to learn a second, if you're doing it when you're an adult, like kids, kids can, it's a little, di a little different with kids, but if you're learning a second language as an adult, you have to learn everything explicitly. You have to learn all of the rules by like thinking about them. They have to have them defined for you. You have to memorize vocab, right? You have to get a bunch of vocab cards and really work at it. Whereas people who are competent 
in a language naturally, they're, they're, that it's their primary language, their natural language. Um, they don't really know. They don't know what's going on. Um, a second language student would do way better at a, on a grammar exam than a natural speaker, even though the natural speaker is probably, in, in many cases, going to be a more competent communicator. They actually, they've internalized all those rules and just know how to run with them without having to think it through step by step. There's advantages to both here. And I've had a lot of um, um, English second language students take critical reasoning and they, sorry for that bumpiness there, um, they can be sometimes nervous about taking the class because they're just trying to keep up with the language, much less you know learn all the course material. But in many ways, um, if you are an English second language student uh, taking this class, you've got an advantage. You are already familiar with thinking about English uh, in a more mechanical, technical, and explicit sort of way, rather than just relying on your intuition. So that, that'll actually work in your favor. If you want to talk more with me about that, though, if you have any questions about it or want more advice, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But the so syntax, these all these grammar rules are largely internalized, but they're conventions nonetheless. And their rules that if we're not playing by the same rules, we will not be able to effectively communicate. Um, so, when I say it's what's literally said, that means we're restraining what meaning we're coming that's coming from this linguistic act level only from the stuff that would proceed from a grammar a dictionary, dictionary and a grammar text. Um, another metaphor I like to do for like how to get yourself to slow your thinking and separate out all these different levels of meaning is imagine you're like an alien who came to earth for the first time and you're like what are these humans doing and then you're like hmm you might suspect you might be like I think they might be using language I think language might be going on for the alien to be able to understand what's happening the first thing that they would have to get uh, is their hand they'd have to get their hands on a dictionary or a grammar text and be kind of be able to decode that to identify or in some way they'd have to identify what are the semantic and syntactic conventions of the language again this is totally public it doesn't require any sneakiness it's just like a one-to-one -one thing like the meaning that you get it's like just look it up in the dictionary nothing no more definitely no more but no less either um, still that contribution um, so uh, let's let me let me use an example from the text. Um, examples are helpful, um, but again, I don't I don't rely on examples heavily in this class because we're not cool with just an intuitive grasp of an idea. We really want to be able to spell it out with some kind of technical precision. So I always I am going to be doing that in how I teach this material. But we'll we'll supplement with some examples here too. Uh, but I I like to avoid teaching by examples. Okay. So here, here's one from the, the textbook that you may recall. Um, the governor has the brains of a three-year-old. So if we were going to figure out what part of the meaning of that utterance we're getting from the linguistic act level, we have to do the very hard work, even though this is a simple level of meaning, we have to do the hard work of slowing our game down, of not speaking any further. Man, I don't know why the video keeps freezing up. Sorry. Of not using anything for interpreting the meaning other than the dictionary and grammar text. Nothing more. We have to take the words directly at face value, not read anything into it, zero interpretation. That's really hard. I, I always tell students to like um, use uh, robot speak to give their answers here. Robot speak. Um, the question on the exam that's going to ask you to say what is literally said you're going to have to give it, a, it's going to be like a quotation, like you're going to like kind of re-articulate what they said, but do it in robot speak so that there's no temptation to start reading any implication into it at all. Okay, we're going to avoid that. Um, so you, you know, break out your thesaurus and start taking it word by word and just really spelling it out. You know, imagine you, you're like, you, you have zero sense of humor, you don't get any subtext, all you you t just take everything super literally what kind of meaning do you get so the governor has the brains of a three-year-old governor has the brains of a three-year-old the political representative for this region uh, whatever you want to spell it, governor um, 
possesses gray matter in their skull that's approximately the same as that of a three-year-old human child. Something in that ballpark. I'm not going to get too picky about these answers, by the way, but I want to make sure when I'm seeing your answers on the exam and, and on the homework, you know, homework's practice for the exam here, um, I want to make sure that your answer is only drawing on meaning that's happening at that level. I, it needs to be clear in your answer that you're you're sticking to the right lane here and not mixing up linguistic act meaning with speech act meaning or conversational act meaning, okay? So um, you'll notice the way that I broke down that answer, I was trying to, it might sound a little weird and awkward, but I'm only trying to call attention to just what kind of meaning I would get from a dictionary and grammar text and nothing more. So it'll sound a little awkward, but that's what that's what's happening there, okay? And we're not getting anything more exciting and we're not being super sneaky. Um, or clever in trying to read into the situation. No context is needed to be able to determine the meaning you get at the linguistic act level. Okay, so that's linguistic act level. Um, yeah, so personally, it's a little strange not having a bunch of students in front of me while I give this lecture because, um, in my experience with this class, especially, especially critical reasoning is that um, it's really helpful to have students asking questions as I'm giving the lecture and you know making sure that I've given a, a good enough explanation I usually try to attack things from a few different directions but um, I this is why I think the study sessions in the evenings on Mondays and Thursdays are going to be very helpful and I really hope a bunch of you show up or if you're not able to show up to that um, that you'll reach out to me and ask questions and and ask for more explanation um, I want to I want to give you everything I got, and sometimes you know in the middle of doing a lecture in a room alone by myself, I will forget something I wanted to say or or something like that. So, um, or just you know when students are asking questions, it pulls more out of me. So, please don't be shy. Please come to the study sessions. Get the help you need. If it's not making sense after doing the reading and listening to my lectures, watching these lectures, um, I can do more to help you. So, we'll we'll keep we'll keep working on it. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on me. Okay, so that's linguistic act level. I'm going to move on to the speech act level. So uh, if the linguistic act level is kind of just decoding the code of words from dictionary and grammar text as kind of like your code book, then speech acts is getting into a different, different territory. Um, okay, let's go back to when I was talking about identifying what's a linguistic act, an, an act that involves language versus one that doesn't involve language. Um, I liked baseball because there's a lot of language going on in baseball, but also there are activities in the game of baseball that have nothing to do with language. So it isn't a linguistic activity to hit a baseball, or to hit a home run, or a sack fly, or to run the bases. Um, running to first base is not a linguistic activity. It's just an act. It's just an activity. It's a non-linguistic activity. If I open the door, it's not a linguistic activity. Um, even though someone might take my behavior and infer or interpret it as signifying something or as evidence that something is going on, that does not mean that it is a linguistic act. Um, for example, um, smoke is not language for fire. Okay, But we say, where there's smoke, there's fire. We're smart about it. I'm like, oh, I saw some smoke. That's evidence that there's fire over there. Not always, of course, but you know, as much as that evidence goes, the adage of where there's smoke, there's fire. When you um, when you express yourself with language, you're doing more than just providing evidence for what's happening with you internally. And this is true even of things that seem pretty intuitively like that, like say facial expressions and tone of voice. Um, there. There are conventions around that, too. They're linked with some natural states, but um, is there anything about um, this that has to mean unhappy or frustrated? No. Maybe you've met somebody who, uh, or you, maybe you yourself identify with this experience of, like, um, people always think that I'm pissed off or something, but it, it's just how my, my face looks. You know, it's not like I mean it. There's no necessary connection between these things. Um, there's no, um, there's nothing about um, the sound glasses that has to mean these things. It's totally arbitrary. 
all linguistic conventions are utterly arbitrary. Uh, and with gestures like this, just arbitrary what this stands for, or this, right? Does it does this have to mean what it means? No, doesn't have to, but it does. Why? Because we're all playing by that rule. It's an arbitrary rule, but because we're all playing by it, we're able to use it and exploit it to communicate with each other. Okay. So be careful here about the line between linguistic activities and non-linguistic activities. But that being said, linguistic activities are still activities and they do things. They make a difference the same way that non-linguistic activities work. And again, this is why I love baseball as the example. It's not just because I'm a big Cubs fan and thinking about baseball a lot these days. This is always the one that I use. And I actually, I was using this before I even uh, kind of had, I, once I got into philosophy, I was like, sports are stupid. I'm not into sports anymore because I think about deep stuff. I mean, maybe not with that level of obnoxiousness going on, but I was just like, meh, sports, meh, meh sports. Um, but in the last few years, actually in the middle of grad school, I was like, yeah, oh yeah, I forgot about sports. Sports are cool. Anyway, I was using this baseball analogy way before I got back into sports. The reason is because um, baseball is a mix of linguistic activities and non-linguistic activities, but both of them together are needed to actually play the game. Both of them have a place to play, and that's the kind of meaning that we're getting into when we're talking about speech acts. With speech acts, we're interested in what is being done, what is the activity that has happened by speaking. When you express yourself in a language, when you take semantic and syntactic conventions to communicate something, to encode a meaning, to paint a picture with your words, right? When you do that, you have done something. Speaking is doing. Sometimes we like to say, well, there's, well, you know, you've got to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk kind of thing. Like there's a, di a difference between speaking and acting, and there certainly is, but it's not that one of them is an activity and the other one is not. That's a misnomer. Speaking is is an action. It's doing something. I, I like to use um, the, I like to use this image. If um, expressing a meaning in a language is what it takes to have a linguistic activity, um, that you're encoding a meaning using semantic syntactic conventions, it's kind of like passing notes in class. You know, there you're encoding something, but then you, in order to communicate, you actually have to give them the piece of paper. The giving of the piece of paper is what we're thinking about. It's that level that we're thinking about when we're talking about the speech act level. By passing this message along, what have you done? What has been done? And still in a way that is public and transparent. Again, the reason why uh, baseball is a good example here, because the rules of baseball are there for anyone to see. No sneakiness required. All you have to do is just relate what you see and observe happening with what the rules are. Just the same way, let's go back to our little diagram, just the same way that it's a one-to-one -one decoding here of semantic and syntactic convention, dictionary, grammar text, and what meaning we get from the linguistic act level. There, all you need to know what the speech act level of meaning, what's literally done and accomplished by speaking, all you need to know that are conventions for behavior. I mentioned um, oops. I mentioned that this kind of level of linguistic analysis is, is slightly indebted to Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein loved to use this word, what he called language games. And he, because he thought all of language was like this instead of allowing for things like linguistic acts and, and some stuff about conversational acts because he was kind of Hey, eh, 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 well, I don't want to give you any misconceptions about Wittgenstein. That might not be entirely fair, but because he's mostly thinking about meaning in terms of doing, uh, linguistic meaning in terms of doing, he thought all meaning was determined based on the rules for language games. So the conventions for behavior are just like the rules of language games. Actually, let me write that in here. The rules for language games. And baseball is a game. It's got rules. Um, and those rules dictate, they give shape to the behaviors that people exhibit and what meaning they have. So let's use another example um, from the textbook for this. Uh, and let's use the baseball one. So let's talk about the baseball example. Um, book talks about this. Umpire yells, you're out. What is the literal, what's the literal meaning? Let's get the linguistic act level of meaning first. What would be that? We always have to figure out that first before we can figure out 
We have to know what the message is, the picture painted with the world, words, before we can figure out the significance or what is being done by passing that message along. Okay, so the linguistic act level of meaning would be something like, you, the batter, are in a state of outness, oh, something like that, right? We could do that. Um, no umpire is going to say that. But there's there's a picture that's painted with the words, you're out, okay? Um, there's a picture there. What is being done by the umpire painting that picture with their words? What is being done with it? Uh, the most straightforward answer for this, don't overthink things, remember, be lazy as much and still get the job done. Um, the umpire, what are they doing by saying that, by painting that picture? They're calling the batter out. Calling the batter out is making a move in the game. The baseball game is not the same after the bat batter is out. It might end the inning because maybe that's the third out. They struck out, that might, and that's the third out, then that's the inning is over. So it makes a difference. The game is not in the same state before the batter is out versus um, after they're out. And also there's a bunch of rules that sort of craft the reality of this speech act calling the batter out. Um, the fan in the stands can also say you're out. They can paint that picture with their words, but they're not doing the same thing as the umpire. You have to be the umpire to call a batter out. What's the fan doing? Maybe expressing their opinion or requesting something from the umpire. Uh, something There might be some things that they're doing by saying you're out, but they're not calling the batter out. Only the umpire is allowed to do that. And maybe only in the way that the umpire does it. Um, in the text, you'll notice here, I've got it copied in the my lecture notes here. In the speech acts section, the book says, in analyzing speech acts, uh, you might want to look for certain rules. You know, does the speaker use any special words or formulas? Is there some response or uptake required? Do they need to have a special position? The special position, like you have to be the umpire to call someone out. Do they have to use special words or formula? Yeah, I mean, the, the umpire can't just say whatever they want to. You're out. It's a pretty common one. Or just, yeah. Sometimes they just growl. Um, but like the book said, if an umpire said, that's three bad ones on you, baby, that wouldn't be calling the batter out. Everyone would be like, what did you just do? They might probably be confused. What was the speech act that was performed? Who knows? Um, but the, the main point here is that speech acts are, the, are things that we do with language, that we can only do through language. Calling a batter out requires language. The rules of baseball ask for that. Um, giving a lecture is something I have to do with language. And a little more interestingly for the subject matter of this course, arguing and debate are activities that require language. They are speech acts. Arguing is a speech act. Um, how do you know what speech act is being performed? Conventions for behavior. And these are largely unspoken, but they are public and explicit. They're not something that requires some trying to get inside people's heads. Um, sometimes uh, we might have different frames of reference for this, like if we have different uh, cultural conventions for behavior, then we might see something as one gesture that it isn't, like a certain action, ver a certain speech act, something got done here that another culture might not recognize. Like uh, maybe... Um, you know, different cultures might have different conventions around what it takes to make an apology. And one culture might look at a behavior and say, well, what was what happened there is not enough for an apology. We don't we didn't recognize an apology happened, whereas another culture might be like, no, that's how you apologize. That's how it works. So people might be operating with different conventions for behavior. But um, those rules are also supposed to be they're, they're I shouldn't say supposed to be. Oh, what am I saying? I'm saying the rules are an external type of object. They're not the kinds of things that are private. Um, we can be walking around with different rules in mind, but the idea of speech acts are supposed to be, um, again, kind of a one-to-one. A -one. Like, does this behavior meet these conditions? And that's it. Things are going to get much sneakier when we get to this level of conversational acts. And I think you'll see once we get here how it's just a totally different game than what's happening here at the speech acts. Um, and the kind of, if you're if you're worried about some fuzziness here on the level of speech acts, well, it's about, it's going to get way fuzzier with conversational acts. 
Um, and that's why I'm saying there's still a literal aspect to what's happening here. If you don't understand the rules or the conventions for behavior, like maybe you're in a foreign culture that you're not familiar with, then you just won't be able to understand what is the speech act that's been performed. You won't get it. Um, the same way that if you don't understand the semantic and syntactic conventions of a language, like a foreign language that you've never studied before, you will not be able to get any of the linguistic act level of meaning. Okay, So there are these connections here. Um, so we're building a little bit here. Um, we're building the meaning. First we figure out this picture that's painted with the words. Then we're asking like, what is being done by passing along that particular message um, to figure out what's the speech act. And then at this level we get um, at the level of conversational acts we get implied meanings and implied I like to just say doings. Okay, so I'm actually going to. Pardon me. Let's. Uh, oops. 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 Here we go. I'm just going to erase this implication. Oh, come on, Phil. And we'll just do that. Implied meanings and implied doings. There, there are kind of two types, just the same way that we've got um, the picture painted with the words from the Linguistic Act, what's literally said. Speech Acts gives us what's literally done. Conversational Acts will take those meanings and kind of flip them with implication, implied meanings and implied doings. There, there is a connection here, um, a similarity between um, you take Linguistic Acts and Speech Acts together, and then Conversational Acts, everything changes. Or not everything, but you know things can change. Things the meanings are going to get modified here, um, at the level of implication. So what are what are we talking about with with conversational implication? Well, conversational implication is like everything that you're meaning that's not decodable by just being familiar with these sorts of conventions, conventions of the language and conventions for behavior. So um, let's let's go back to our alien friend who is visiting Earth and trying to understand what is happening with human communication. Um, first, they need to get their hands on the grammar, and text, and dictionary, or construct one, the, an equivalent on their own. And maybe they're very linguistically trained, and they're linguists themselves. So the alien figures it out. The next thing they need to do is probably get culturally informed and to see how there are what are what are all the rules that human beings have for expectations for behavior on each other um, and that would be needed to figure out what speech acts are like in the context of baseball to figure out it went back with that baseball example we were going to figure out what um, what action was being performed you need to know the rules of baseball those are rules for behavior they're not it's not like a dictionary it's not conventions of associated meanings they're rules for how we're going to act but they define how um, these linguistic behaviors, these linguistic acts, take on significance as a part of the wider activities that we're doing. Okay, what happens with conversational acts though? There's all this leftover meaning. There's all this speculative stuff. We um, implication really comes from how we are incredible cognitive multitaskers. We always are trying to get more bang for our buck. We're trying to do as many things at the same time as we can, um, and in that way. Um, even in our just our intuitive capacities, you are ultimately competent. Uh, I mean, there's still miscommunication that occurs, and you may not feel like you get, always are good at articulating your feelings or thoughts. But even in that case, you maybe it's invisible to you just how much competency you really have because you have a ton. The fact that you can navigate impl implication, that you can pick up on the uptake, maybe not all the time, but even at, to be able to do it at all is a tremendous cognitive achievement. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to be able to do. Um, it's, it's one of the kinds of problems that um, people who are constructing artificial intelligences that are capable of uh, you know, interacting with language, it's one of the toughest problems for trying to be successful there. Um, it, it's, it's a remarkable feat. And we're going to describe the mechanics of how this sorts of this sort this sort of works. So, um, if if uh, let let's let's go let's use an example. So there's an example we've left behind. Let's go back to it. The the one from the book about the governor has the brains of a three year old. So we're saying like the 
the political representative for this region um, possesses gray matter in their skull it's approximately the same as that of a three-year-old human child that was the linguistic act literal meaning and then we want to know what's literally done what's the speech act um, the speech act would be really just indicating there's nothing more exciting going on there the book talks about some of the basic speech acts that we do we've got we indicate things that's one thing we do with language we ask questions we make we give commands and we express our emotions those are kind of like the four basic categories we do other interesting things too like umpires calling batters out or um, someone marrying people that's a, one another example the book talked about so there's a lot of answers we can give here for speech acts um, I would say the speaker in this example they're just indicating they're making a claim about what's going on with the governor's brains that's it just making a claim that would be the answer oh by the way that's what something I was forgetting um, if the literal meaning is always going to be like something in the answer that you would give like on the homework would be like something in quotation marks oh I can't make that black there we go um, like something in Let's try this. Now nah, it's working. It's always something in quotation marks. The answer to a speech act is always going to be a verb. It's always because it's an activity. It's always going to be a doing. So, person who says governor's the governor has the brains of a three-year-old. What are they doing? They're indicating something. They're making a claim. Those are verbs. So th those are good answers there. Um, but now, if if I asked you to tell me what did the person mean? Like if you're if you're gonna turn on that little intuitive voice we've been keeping turned off this whole time, um, what would that intuitive voice tell you the person meant? I can't ask students right now because there are no students, but you know I, I'm guessing we're probably gonna be on the same page. But sometimes people have different interpretations. That's another reason I miss having students around. Sometimes we interpret things differently. That's okay. Um, I we're we're not always gonna have the exact same answers here. But what matters to me, especially when it comes to like exam time is that you're using the method uh, properly so even even if we're using the same method like this linguistic analytic method here if we're using it the same way we still might get at some different answers there could still be some discussion disagreement controversy maybe maybe there's more than one way to skin a cat on these things but I want to make sure that we're using the technique properly um, so in this case if we were gonna I, I think probably the meaning that most of us are gonna pick up on if the person says the governor has the brains of a three-year-old what do they really mean they mean the governor is stupid something like that um, and what are they really doing then well they're insulting the governor so there's an implied meaning and there's an implied doing that didn't show up at these first two levels the elected representative of this region has gray matter in their skull approximately the same as that of a three-year-old child that picture that's painted with the word what's not a part of that picture is the governor is unintelligent or incompetent or stupid or something like that that implied meaning it was not present just based on the semantic and syntactic conventions of language this is why you really have to show restraint in how you're you're thinking and interpreting when you're giving the answer for what is the linguistic act and what's being done by painting that picture is different than what's being done by painting the picture of the implied meaning if you're saying the governor is stupid that's insulting if you're saying here is a here are the state of affairs of what's going on with someone's brain that's not an insult not a, it doesn't meet the conditions for that but once I see uh, oh, what you really mean is not that they have brains that are similar as that of a three-year-old child what you really mean is that the governor is really dumb now I can see that what you have done is insult the governor so there's always gonna be this kind of um, there's this the story is like slowly getting told and there's a little narrative here this these meanings build on each other and our intuition that intuitive voice in our head that tells us what people mean it just shoots to the end of this story it just it goes through this sequential step-by-step -step process like a lightning bolt and you don't see all the action that's taking place here but that's what we're doing we're slowing down our thinking to try to see what's taking place okay um, and there and what the, the, our understanding of what's happening with the linguistic meaning will change when we start taking into account implication there will be a change to the meaning and there'll be a change to the doing okay. so what is going on here how are we capable of doing this um, 
there's a lot to say about this, and it's a more complicated story than just matching um, an observation of what's happening with certain conventions. Okay, so it's not this decoding thing that's going on with the first two levels. Um, it's something different. Um, I need to grab a glass of water and take a little break. So I'm going to take a break. Um, won't be a break for you, but um, I'm just kind of there'll be a little gap here, and um, and I'll finish explaining conversational acts. All right, I'm back. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience. <laughs> no time really for you, um, though for me. Um, one little thing that I realized that I uh, needed to talk about that I didn't, just a quick little thing. Um, going back to speech acts here, just for a second. The book talks a lot about explicit performatives. Um, and I don't care too much about this. Um, the thereby test, what's a performative versus an explicit performative, doesn't much matter to me. Um, I mean, performatives are just these like speech acts, the thing that you're doing um, when you express yourself in a linguistic act, you express yourself in a language. Um, and there are some there are some things that we're doing with language that are particularly interesting to um, this class like these activities that are involved as a part of the broader activity of it, arguing or debating, drawing conclusions, basing something on the, on the basis of something else, like taking, making a claim on the basis of something else, stipulating, assuring, conceding, admitting, supporting, denying, granting, replying, and a lot more. There's a bunch of these that we'll actually be tracking in the next module when we're trying to understand the basic maneuvers and mechanisms of arguments uh, a lot of those will be speech acts. They'll be the things that we can do as a part of arguing uh, to try to, um, uh, well, defend positions or attack positions or do all the things that we're doing as a part of critical analysis to seek the truth. Okay, but that, so don't, um, if you saw the book making a big deal about um, explicit performatives and performatives in general, and you'll notice I didn't assign any exercises that required you to identify those things. Um, but you still need to be able to identify what is the action done by expressing yourself in a language. So when you paint a picture with your words at the linguistic act level, what are you doing by passing that picture along to somebody else? That's the speech act. And that's always going to be a verb. It'll always be a doing. Okay. So back on to conversational acts. Let's begin at the beginning here. Or, uh, I want or, uh, you know, is I actually mean to say... I want us to get the kind of big picture view of this. And to do that, I'm going to actually be kind of living down here in the what is responsible for creating this meaning. Okay, so we've got explicit meaning that's happening over here, and then we've got implied meanings that are happening over here. Where do they come from? What's going on? Well, there's it's kind of there's a little story to tell about this. Um, I think the the easiest way to understand what Paul Grice is arguing about how conversational implication works is, I, I think I'm going to need both hands for this. I hope the microphone isn't awkward. Little chair that I'm in. Let's see if I can. My microphone's so large. Okay. I think this is working. Microphone picking up. Yes. Okay. All right. So, what's going on here? Like, a, oh, yeah. Let's go back to the diagram really quick. So remember I'm saying these meanings are building off of each other. So I need to know the linguistic act before I can get to the level of the speech act. And i got to know both of those before I can get to the level of the conversational act. And here's the reason why. What's going on in conversational implication is that you're interpreting, you're reading into what someone is saying. Right? We use those phrases to talk about this. Reading between the lines, picking up on the subtext. But before you're going to start doing that interpretive work, when you're listening and trying to figure out what someone is saying, something's got to provoke it. So, you know, when we're speaking with each other, sometimes we're like, what do they really mean? Sometimes. And other times we're not. Uh, hopefully in my lectures, this is not a time where you're like, what does Tim really mean by speech acts are the word, the action that is done by expressing oneself with a linguistic act? I'm trying to be as transparent, straightforward, being like, this is what I mean to say. This is what's happening. No subtext here, no wink, wink, nudge, nudge thing happening. Nothing like that is going on. Um, you can take my words at face value. You can take them at just their meaning at the linguistic act level and the speech act level. Everything that's public, transparent, 
Nothing sneaky. Nothing sneaky to see here. But other times, you you are triggered to go looking for those like, oh, what's really going on here, right? So what's the difference there? What what provokes me to go interpreting? And then how will I actually conduct that interpretation? What will guide me in that? That's what Paul Grice wanted to understand. Paul Grice's claim is that everything starts with what, let's actually go to the lecture notes, what he calls the cooperation principle. So uh, Paul Grice says, you know, here we go down here, make your, uh, he, he words a lot of these laws of how language and meaning gets determined as kind of as these maxims, as these um, like uh, general guidelines or rules. So the cooperation principle is worded like a command. Make your conversational contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. What he is saying is that when I'm, I, I, I'm kind of operating, when I'm interpreting what you mean, I'm operating from a standpoint of expecting you to act that way. I'm expecting that the meaning of what you're communicating will be guided by what we're trying to accomplish by the particular type of linguistic activity we're engaging, what the purpose of that linguistic activity is. That's the key part. Um, for Grice, he's saying successful communication requires or it implies or expects cooperation. Sometimes we're not cooperative with each other. Sometimes uh, we say things not wanting someone to understand what we really mean by it or something like that. So it, Paul Grice is not saying we're, we're always cooperative. It's not assuming a kind of utopia or something like that. But he's saying when I'm interpreting someone, I'm trying to figure out what they are saying based on what I think they're trying to do. What is the purpose of the activity that we're engaged in? That's going to guide it. And even if... Um, even if the, the, the two people have two very different ideas of what they're trying to accomplish or their purposes are at cross purposes, um, they're still interpreting the other person based on an, an understanding of what we're up to here. So even, um, I, can, I can understand, well, okay, uh, let, we'll get into some examples in a second. I want to I actually get some more principles down on the table before I do that. Okay, so everything starts with an understanding of purpose that's guiding why we're even talking to each other in the first place. That's important. Um, what's also important is um, this word I used a second ago, expectation. So Paul Grice is um, picking up on, or he's proposing that what determines conversational implication, what provokes it, and how what's going to determine how we interpret what things people are implying is based off of our expectations for their behavior. And that's what, uh, as this lecture goes further here, you know, he's got this cooperation principle. This is kind of like the umbrella principle uh, of what we expect. But then there, he breaks it down into d detail with these different Gricean maxims. Quantity, quality, relevance, and manner. And I'm going to have to talk through all of these, and we will talk through all of these, and I'll explain what's going on. You will need to be able to identify in a given situation what Gricean maxim is relevant for that um, linguistic interaction. But basic idea here is, is about expectations for behavior. Um, here, here's the whole story right here, um, starting from the beginning. First, I pick up on what you're literally saying and doing. I pick up on the linguistic act level of meaning and the speech act level of meaning based on my understanding or my competency with being familiar with the conventions of semantics and syntax for the language you're expressing yourself in and my understanding of the conventions for behavior, the rules for language games, for activities that involve the use of language. So I get that meaning. I'm understanding that much. And then I'm comparing that against what my expectations are for your behavior. What would make sense for you to do? How, how, how ought you to be acting in this situation um, in order to achieve a certain type of purpose or goal? When those things line up, and there's no, there's nothing weird about them. They're like, yeah, the the meaning that we're getting from linguistic and speech act level is what is being called for. It's what I was expecting you to do. Maybe what I'm doing right now is exactly what you're expecting me to do. Explain the material on, on, that the class is studying and preparing you for the exam. I mean, nothing nothing goofy to see here. 
If that's happening, then we won't be provoked to um, look for conversational implication. But when those things are out of whack, when there's what I'm going to call a breach between what you literally said and did, linguistic and speech act levels of meaning, and what my expectations were for your behavior, when those things are not synced up, then I'm like, hmm, that's weird. This can't be what's really going on because that's just too strange. It couldn't be that way. Now, sometimes the world is that strange and sometimes we miscommunicate. It happens. But that's not our first thought. Our first thought is, that's weird. I must be missing something. There must be something else going on. So what provokes looking for implication is a breach between what you literally say and do and what my expectations are for your, for your linguistic behavior. Past that point, if I'm what I'm what I'm basically doing by interpreting an implied meaning is I'm trying to throw some something else into the situation here to get things to sync back up again so that what was weird and strange actually makes sense again ah it's like that joke someone tells a joke and you're like wait oh I I, I get it I got it you're like looking for an interpretation until there's one that makes sense that's what's happening with conversational implication too but it, it, it's a little there, there are some more detailed and robust principles here that are guiding that interpretive process. Uh, in particular, based on what was weird, will sort of determine what's needed to make sense of it. Um, sort of like uh, what kind of cork, what kind of shape cork do you need to fit a certain type of hole? Well, based on the shape of the hole, you're going to need a different type of cork to plug it up. That's like what's happening here too. Um, let me um, let me demonstrate this with a um, with an example. And, and well, there are going to be a bunch more examples for um, as I talk through the, all of the different Gricean maxims, all the different expectations that Paul Grice thinks we have for how we're going to communicate. But um, let's, let's go back to our governor has the brains of a three-year-old one. Let's talk about that one again. Um, so we got to the point where we we're like, well, I think what's intuitively or I'm sorry. What what what's implied? What the implied meaning here is? You, then your little voice in your head, that intuitive voice, will tell you something, and it usually does a pretty decent job. Listen to it when you're answering. Like, what's the implied meaning? You, or it can be a part of that um, problem solving. Um, so what have we said? We said um, what they really mean to say when they say the governor is the brains of a three-year-old is that the governor is stupid, unintelligent, dumb, something like this. How did how did we get there? Um, why did we even go looking for an implication in this particular case? Well, that would be answered by Paul Grice's maxim uh, of quality. So let's skip to quality. Quality is one of the simpler ones on the list here. Qual the quality maxim is to say that we expect that people are not going to say things that they believe to be false. Not that we expect people to not say false things because that's an unreasonable expectation. Humans are confused all the time, so we get things wrong. But what I do expect you to do, what is within your power, is to be honest, to not lie. And I also expect that you won't make claims that you don't have adequate evidence to defend. So the short versions of these is don't lie, don't bullshit. That really captures the meaning right there. There's not too much going on. Um, let's, let's go back to, this is why it's so important to get the robot speak of the Linguistic Act level of meaning. Let's go back to our answer there. What was the, what was the literal meaning what was literally being said? What was the linguistic act level of meaning? Something like the elected representative for this area um, has gray matter in their skull approximately the same as that of a three-year-old human child. If someone made that claim, I'm going to be surprised. If they really mean it, I'm like, what? Why, why would you believe that? How could you possibly believe that? That's so clearly false. Like an adult human being walking around with a three-year-old human brain in there, or the, what would be equivalent to a three-year-old human brain. Uh, I've never heard of a case like that. Um, and even if that did happen, maybe it's like, it'd probably be super rare or something like that. Maybe it's not something you'd just be like, oh yeah, it happens all the time. And why would they know that about the governor too? Probably if he's a, we, <laughs> this has been some recent news stuff about the health reports of politicians, but most of the time we don't know what's going on with the health of our politicians, so. How would you know that? How would you have adequate evidence to know that that's true? It's an outlandish claim. Um, you might have already been thinking to yourself, well, I know what's going on linguistically with this example. It's a metaphor. And it is a metaphor. People are, the person who is saying this is 
saying something that they don't really believe to be true, but which they think illustrates the thing that they do think is true, that the governor is stupid. Okay? Um, but that's the thing that's provoking me to go looking for an implication in the first place, is that the way that the person is behaving seems unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. Why would someone ever believe that? How could ever, anyone ever believe that the governor really does have the brains of a three-year-old human child? That makes no sense. So there, and then I'm like, well, maybe not so fast. Maybe there's something else going on here. But notice also, I know what kind of gap we've got in our hands. And this is why it's important to know the Gricean maxims. I know that we have a quality problem. What was weird was that they said something that seems so obviously false. I'm, you know, I'm concluding that they do believe it. To, they can't possibly believe it. They can't legitimately believe it. They're lying. And I'm not expecting people to lie. Maybe I, even if you are cynical, even if you are cynical, this expectation is still present. Um, and sometimes certain situations happen and, and um, you know, you will learn that in this particular context, you need to not assume that the person will be trustful. So like someone chronically lies to you then yeah, maybe you're going to change your expectations for the situation. Um, I'm going to pick up on that thread in a second. But um, in general, I'm surprised by this. I will generally assume that when someone says something to me, they at least sincerely believe it to be true, even if I am skeptical of that, the truth of that claim. Um, but this case seems like it's impossible. It's just so unreasonable for me to interpret the speaker as doing that. So I'm like, there's something else going on. And whatever is going to be the implied meaning that I throw into the situation that will cause everything to make sense again, it's going to have to deal with that problem about lying. So the the implied meaning that I'm going to interpret in this situation better be a meaning that doesn't run afoul of the quality maxim. It better be something that I can reasonably expect is what the speaker would believe is true. And something like the governor being dumb or stupid that's probably much more plausible that someone could have that kind of belief rather than this belief that they have gray matter in their skull that's approximately the same as a three-year-old human child. That's much less likely. Okay, so that's what's going on there um, with that example. And there, there's actually a little bit more to talk about here. Why did we pick this particular meaning that the governor is stupid? Well, that's going to be informed by something else. So here's the other thread. Grace, that, um, expectations are really what's driving he has a couple different things in mind. Let's go back to our um, chart here. So expectations for linguistic behavior uh, is what determines what shapes these implied meanings and implied doings. That's where the meaning is coming from. The meaning of speech act is coming from rules for language games, conventions for behavior. The meaning of Same thing here. So these expectations um, can be general and specific. The general expectations, what we mean by these are expectations that are present no matter the context. In every context, we have there are some expectations we have for people's behavior, um, all other things being equal. And those are the Gricean maxims that I will be explaining in more detail here in a second and that the book was talking about. Um, specific expectations are the things that change from situation to situation. So you might, you might know some things about the person you're talking to, like they're a liar. Or you might know something about the specific context of the activity that's taking place, or the subject matter that we're talking about, or what culture we're in, or all those things that are different from circumstance to circumstance. I mean, really, most saliently for Paul Grice, it would be the different purposes that we have for speaking for each other. So like right now, my purpose is instruction, education. That's the point. Um, in another context, I might be trying to make you laugh or something. It's like the comedic purpose of me getting in front of you with a microphone and talking. You know, like So there's different things that we do with language. And sensitivity to all those different activities and what they require and what's relevant to them that is going to bring in some other expectations that are a little more specific, that are not universal, they're not general to all circumstances regardless of context. And in short, I'm going to call these background 
assumptions. Oops, oops. Background assumptions or knowledge, background knowledge. Um, and this is the last thing that I could put on a test for you. And this is another reason why we might get different answers, even though we're using the same methodology here, is that we all have different background assumptions about how the world works and what's going on with it. Human psychology, the different purposes that people speak for. Uh, we have different knowledge of the world. We have a different idea of what is needed in order to accomplish that purpose. Um, so th that's all going to affect how we um, interpret the implied meanings and implied doings of uh, at, at this conversational act level. Um, so we have to keep that in mind too, but it's still a remarkable achievement if Paul Grice is right in identifying that there are some universal expectations that we have regardless of the context, or at least that if it's different in a certain context, like the liar case, um, there's, there's still the standing expectation for telling the truth. It takes something else to trump that, to change that expectation, some other specialized background knowledge that super that would then modify that expectation and replace it with a new expectation. Um, maybe Paul Grice is wrong about some of this stuff, but it, it, it's interesting and compelling. Um, maybe there are some counters, and you know, this, this stuff gets discussed. There's, there's everything. Is That's the general story here of what's happening with information. It is uh, taking the first two levels of meaning, once we've got that under our belt, and we compare them against the expectations, and when there's a disconnect, that provokes us to be looking for an interpretation of the um, And they will also, like I was saying, the, the kind of shape of the gap will determine the shape of the fix. So the expectations not only provoke us, but they also provide us. In short, in short, implication, interpreting impl implied meanings, is an attempt to take some situation that's surprising or weird or that doesn't make sense and make sense out of it. Um, in this way, it's very similar to the principle of charity on the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I mean, Paul Grice is saying, that's why he calls it the cooperation principle. Um, that, I mean, is, that, that really makes sense. I never put two and two together there. But, you know, I've been saying the Code of Intellectual Conduct is all about cooperation, and the soul of the code is charity. Um, if you're cooperatively interested, then you'll use charity. If not, then you wouldn't. Um, and Paul Grice is saying the same thing about language. Language only works because of an assumption of charity on our parts. That we're, we're basically, we come to the table of a conversational encounter assuming that our conversational partner is reasonable, rational, rational, sensible, that they're they're directing their behaviors in the conversation uh, in a way that um, is going to help us get what we need to get done. It's intentional, it's informed, it's intelligent. Okay, and when it's not, then we're like, well, wait, maybe we're missing something. And the implication is an attempt to make sense of that, um, to try to cast the speaker, find a way that I could actually see the other speaker as um, doing something sensible and rational. That's that's what's going on here. And this doesn't always work. You know, miscommunication occurs. But we do try this first. We're in a situation and we're like, that's weird. We're like, what do they mean? We first try to do what we can on our interpretive side. If after multiple attempts I'm like, do you mean this? And they're like, no. You mean this? No. Or if, even if I don't get the chance for the feedback, I'm like, could they mean this? No, that wouldn't make sense. What about that? Uh, I don't. I have no idea. Then, you know, there might be actual confusion and mis a failure to communicate. Um, or we might make certain assumptions of like, well, that would make that would be reasonable if they meant that. But that again is using expectations informed by our background assumptions, which are specific to us and different for different people. So it makes sense to us, may not make sense to somebody else. Um, or they might be making sense of it in a different way. And so miscommunication can occur naturally that way too. Um, one little note here before I go further. Um, the Gricean maxims, even though they're worded like commands, they're not really commands. Um, in other words, Paul Grice is not saying, if you want to communicate effectively, never violate these maxims. He's not saying that. He's just saying, we expect people to follow these rules, and when they don't, we roll with the punches. Um, it's totally fine to violate Gricean maxims for the purpose of communication. 
uh, and to intentionally violate them, like metaphors. Metaphors are obvious, explicit violations of Gricean maxims, and um, and and a lot of times we do this. We 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 could say it flat-footed. We could say it directly. Um, we could be straightforward, but we're not straightforward because we want to pack extra meaning into our expression. We want to kill two birds with one stone. We want to be efficient with language. So we intentionally violate Gricean maxims when we're speaking, counting on our audience to put the pieces together, get the correct implication, and understand what we really mean. We can pack so much information in that way. It also it might be um, useful in the sense of just audience to be more active listeners. I have a friend who's a poet and he loves he he like metaphors for everything. He never says anything straightforward. And I'm this like spell it out for me, clarity principle, code of intellectual conduct, analytic philosopher type of person. And we we're able to debate fine because we can play by each other's rules, but he really likes to use metaphor. Because it gets people to think. They can't just like be like, oh, okay, that's what you mean. Okay. They have to actually do some processing to even understand what is meant. Uh, and that's something he's interested in for uh, ethical reasons. He wants to provoke people to be you know, thinking more robustly and listening more carefully. So that's part of that. We're, we exploit that. As, as effective, um, competent communicators, we violate these rules, no problem. Most humor is like, most comedy is like this. Most comedy. for comedic purposes, so that can happen. Um, oh, I left out one of my favorite metaphor, illustrative metaphors. Um, let's also just, at this point, look at, as a reminder, remember that for Paul Grice, here, let, let's go back to the diagram. So, okay. So I told you that the meaning that the changes, the adjustments to meaning that happen at the conversational act level with these implied meanings and implied doings are um, analogous to the, the meanings and doings of linguistic acts and speech acts. So, like the implied doing is still going to be a verb type of answer. Um, pardon me. Oh, that's right. Okay, so um, they're, they're the same type of answer, but um, once I'm looking at it through this lens of the conversational implication and that um, thought process of how modifying what's literally said and literally done to mean something different than I saw it before. I'm, I'm changing the meaning to solve this this mystery of like what the heck do they really mean by this? Because um, that doesn't make any sense. Um, however, there's going to be an extra little twist. So the speech acts are all going to be like public activities. They're, they're, they're the kinds of things that as long as you know the rules for the language game and you're watching the person's behavior, you can interpret what they did. Implied doings are a little different. I want to put a little note here about that um, to remind you that implied doings are about um, secret things. They're the things you have to be clever in interpreting. They're a matter of intentions, people's intentions, their purposes, and their goals. Because in terms of all of the things that we have publicly available to us to observe, let's get that in there, um, that exhausts it. Ling linguistic acts and speech acts, like the, there's nothing more here. There's no wiggle room for adjusting these meanings if we're just going off of what we're able to observe directly in our experience. If we're going to start modifying meaning, the only thing that's going to be able to justify it is something hidden like the stuff that goes on in people's heads. And that's what intentions and purposes and goals are all about. Those implied doings. Um, that That's the thing, that's the X factor. I'm listening to you, I'm hearing what you're saying, I'm watching your behavior, I'm seeing the circumstances around us. That's all kind of a given. The question though, I, I don't know what's actually happening inside your mind. I don't know what you're trying to do. Like, why are you speaking right now? <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here. Like, what is happening? Why? What are you up to? That there's room for speculation about. That's where there's wiggle room for interpretation, is if I'm adjusting language based on that hidden factor that I can speculate about. Okay, so that's part of what's happening with 
um, conversational implication is I'm going to be speculating on intentions, purposes, and goals. Now, in the case of um, like the governor has a brains with three-year-old, the implied doings that happen here at the conversational act level are what I'm just going to ask for as what is the conversational action. Um, in that case, we're saying, well, they're insulting. They're insulting the governor. That's what they're doing. And you could put that answer in there, and that'd be fine. It would be like just an adjustment to what I saw the speech act above now that I'm taking into account this implied meaning that what the person is really saying is that the governor is stupid. But I could also start, uh, I could also answer what's the conversational act by figuring out what is the effect of the person's speaker or what's the intended effect of the speaker, as the, as the textbook is talking about. What are they trying to do? What do I think that they're trying to do? Um, are the, they... They're in. They. I guess they're trying to insult the the governor um, by speaking this way. But then that doesn't completely answer it because why didn't they just say the governor is stupid? Why are they trying to say the governor has the brains of a three-year-old? Well, there must be some extra purpose to why they would speak in a roundabout way. Why they wouldn't just speak more directly and sensibly, perhaps. And that's <clears throat> that kind of speculative work is what. And explaining that thought process is what I will be asking for on the exam when I'm asking you to explain where, how is the conversational implication generated? Where is that coming from? What are the background assumptions and knowledge that you have and which Gricean maxims are relevant here that help you decode and inform what you think is really happening? That's what I will be asking you to do. Um, in my next lecture, I'll give you more advice about how to give those kinds of answers because it's pretty tricky. Um, and how to identify the, di the different Gricean maxims. That's another detail I'm going to leave for the, for the next lecture. So next lecture, we'll talk about the different Gricean maxims, um, how they become, what, what they're asking for and how they get violated when we're speaking to each other with plenty of examples. And um, I'll talk about giving more advice about how to explain your answers about how these implications get generated. That, that's a big thing. But, but here's the, here's the um, illustrative metaphor that I because the conversational implication is all about purpose, it's all about what we're trying to do. When miscommunication happens, it's often because two people have a different idea of what what is the purpose of the activity, and thus they have a different frame of reference that they're using to interpret the meaning of what everyone is saying. And one of my favorite examples of this would be like a romantic comedy, like a scene in a romantic comedy. Maybe you've seen a, a movie that has done the scene like this before. It's a common trophy sort of thing. But two people are having dinner with each other. And one person thinks that what they're doing is having a date, that they're going on a date. The other person just thinks they're having dinner with a friend. You know, no big deal. Just having dinner with a friend. Just having a date. Just dinner with a friend. And then they're having their conversation over dinner. And just like, it's a comedy of error, right? Where people are talking back and forth completely misinterpreting each other as the independent objective observer of all this. You see how the two people have a different idea of what's happening, and so it's, it's hilarious how much they're missing each other or getting confused by what each other are saying or awkward things are happening. Um, that is a just a perfect example of what Paul Grice is going for here, and maybe give some support for his case here, that um, how we're interpreting what people are saying to us really, you know, ultimately, depends on our understanding of what we think is happening in terms of the purpose of the conversational encounter. Um, so that's our frame of Okay. Man, I really wish I could ask all of you uh, if you have any questions about what's going on. You're not here. Hopefully we will talk about it soon. Hopefully I'm explaining this well. There's going to be a follow-up lecture to this one. Uh, like I said, where we'll go through the details of the different Bryce and Maxims, what's happening with all of them, how to detect them, um, and um, how to work with them for the interpretations. And then also, um, way more specific advice. I'm going to try to give you a lot of support here in doing what's a very difficult activity, how to explain the thought process that's behind the answers you give to how to interpret what's going on with, with these different cases of people talking to each other that I'll be asking you to give a linguistic analysis of. Okay, so that's where that's where we're headed next. Um, thanks for watching, and um, you'll see this posted soon. I'm, I'm opening up the module. Um, check out this lecture, and there'll be, there'll be another one uh, very soon, so stay tuned. And maybe I'll see you tonight. Six to eight.